My name is Lorenzo Macaluso. I'm the Director of Green Business Services at the Center for Ecotechnology, CET. We're a nonprofit environmental organization, been around for over 35 years, and we help residents, businesses, and institutions improve their environmental performance through energy efficiency and waste reduction, recycling, composting activities. In the Pioneer Valley, we've had a, a history of being a national leader of setting up commercial food waste composting opportunities. CET, in conjunction with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, and area businesses and area haulers and area farmers have worked over the course of almost two decades to set up an infrastructure for food waste diversion, hauling, and then processing for composting uh, throughout the Pioneer Valley. And we've helped work with all of those different stakeholders to set up that program, set up all the hauling infrastructure, as well as train and support the, the individual business owners, the restaurants, the supermarkets, hotels, etc., to, to properly separate their materials so that the farmer is going to be able to produce a, a viable product from this material that has been traditionally looked at as a waste product. Recycling Works is a business and institutional recycling and composting assistance program that we provide under contract to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and allows us to provide a range of services to businesses throughout Massachusetts. We have a website that has a range of resources available from how-to documents, regulatory information, case studies about successful programs, as well as a geographically searchable database that can connect you with service providers and haulers to recycle or compost a range of materials. That hotline service provides some basic technical assistance for any kind of recycling and composting question that a business might have. It also is the entry point to even broader potential technical assistance that CET could provide on site for larger generators of materials and significant food waste generators. And we can then come onto your facility and help provide training and logistical support to implement these types of programs. In the early 90s, the Massachusetts DEP implemented what they call waste bans, which prohibit people from throwing a range of items in the trash. These include everything from paper and cardboard and bottles and cans to car batteries and tires and things like that. There's a new material that will likely be added to the list of banned materials, which is food waste from commercial facilities that generate a ton of food waste per week or more. It's anticipated to go live in the summer of 2014, and CET through Recycling Works is here to help commercial entities in, in this area and throughout the state find the best options for compliance. Shriners Hospital in Springfield is one of the facilities that we've helped a number of years ago and they're a great example of uh, there wasn't a huge amount of cost savings opportunity but being a hospital they were very concerned about odor and vermin and all the perceived challenges with with composting and their site logistics were such that the only place that we were able to site the collection container was actually very close to the air intake area for the entire hospital. And so we were able to set up a system with appropriate amount of um, collection frequency and uh, collection logistics so that there was never an odor issue or any vermin problems. And um, if a hospital can implement a program at, to the very high standards that they have to have and with the proximity to um, air intake for the entire facility, we feel like we could help almost anybody get a successful program up and running. We work with businesses every day and we know how important it is for any operational decision to make cost sense. If, if it doesn't help uh, the bottom line in some way, it's often very hard to justify any of these types of changes. And in our experience, you can implement recycling, programs or if you're in the food industry a composting program at a, a, at a minimum of a cost-neutral uh, scenario. 
were able to help make some determinations on what the cost impact might be when we provide the assistance that we provide. If you are a small facility, oftentimes it's unrealistic to expect significant cost savings, but when you tackle your most prevalent recyclable or compostable material, we can often find a way to have that be relatively cost neutral or some very modest cost savings perhaps. The larger your facility is and the more of a certain type of material you might generate, whether it's food waste or cardboard or some other recyclable material, that's oftentimes where there's the greatest potential for more significant cost savings. Oftentimes, groups of small businesses contract jointly for their trash and recycling services. And this often represents an opportunity where even if you're a small business that independently, you might not realize those cost benefits or it might be harder to find sort of niche services for recycling and composting, by aggregating your materials with other area businesses, that presents some opportunities to have larger purchasing power, uh, a bigger scale, and, and capitalize on those opportunities from an operational cost savings perspective and logistics of collaboration. We also recommend that anybody call their current hauler to find out what services they provide and how they can improve their environmental performance and how they can do what they're doing more cost effectively. Uh, your hauler can be a resource and we're also available to supplement whatever your hauler is telling you through the Recycling Works program. Sometimes we find that implementing a new program for recycling or composting can be pretty overwhelming and sometimes the best approach is a stepwise approach. For example, at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, we started first with back of the house, so the kitchen, really making sure that all of the prep materials, plate scrapings, those sorts of things that were managed by hospital staff got tackled first. Once that got established, was running well, was successful, any bugs were worked out, then we started looking at front of the house and the more public spaces of how to incorporate the materials that could also get composted from that area into the existing program instead of trying to do the whole thing all at once. It was a much more manageable process for Cooley Dickinson to take on. Training, education, and signage are key to any successful program. Uh, when you have the back of the house perspective or your staff and employees side, there's turnover, there's shifting roles, and so having good materials so that all all staff understand what their expectations are is very important and that can be achieved through good signage and good materials in like an employee handbook or something like that. Uh, and similarly from the front of the house side of things, the customers, the public, they also need uh, good signage, good clear messaging about what materials go where in order to have a successful program and in order to have, for it to be more natural and more flowing for somebody to do the right thing most people aren't going to spend a whole lot of time thinking about where do I put this can in my hand. So you want to make that as easy as possible. And that's another area where Recycling Works is able to help produce some of those customized signage. But there's also a lot of tools all over that you can do and you can make one yourself. Many businesses have an employee or a certain manager or somebody at various levels of, of the organization that might take this on as their responsibility or feel especially passionate about making uh, recycling a reality at their business. And Recycling Works can be the support they need to have consultation, third-party verification, and general technical support to make sure that the whole organization feels comfortable with the new program that the advocate at the business is, is trying to make happen. River Valley Market in Northampton has done a great job with recycling and composting, but even a program like theirs that's well established and doing a good job 
still needed a little extra help. And a couple of years ago, they got in touch with us because they were wondering how to properly recycle their fluorescent bulbs. And so we were able to help them find um, a good outlet for those materials to get properly handled. We originally started the River Valley Market because of the local farming economy and what we wanted to do with the farmers in the area. Right from the very beginning, River Valley Market started a compost and a recycling program through Alternative Recycling, which is another thing, the environmental stewardship. So we had the local farms, the local economy, the environmental stewardship, and then of course the third bottom line would be money. We spend a lot of money when we take things to the dump or we have to, especially compostables to the dump, large volume. So we try um, very hard to reduce that as much as possible. And it's been very successful so far. We have several farmers that pick up some of the waste from the produce department that they call in the morning. It's part of our daily routine, so if we've got any uh, shrink or waste to compost that's not good for survival center or a soup kitchen, uh, that could just go right into the compost. Uh, even if we're, we're washing our hands or whatever, um, you know, even paper products, if it's light paper, that can go right in there. That's all going to break down when they, when they uh, uh, work this out in the field. It doesn't create more work. It's um, basically part of our routine. We, we take this out when it's pretty much full, and we either save this for local farmers that might need it for chickens or pigs. A lot of people even just uh, compost it uh, themselves at their house. That saves us uh, having to pay to have it taken away. But if people don't take it, uh, then it uh, goes right into our uh, compost compactor. Any of our uh, plastic uh, containers that are no longer of use, uh, those can go right into a recycle bin. We just keep a simple bucket back here. So all plastics can go in there, clamshell packaging, uh, things like that. If it just needs a quick rinse, it's not a big deal. We, we can't uh, keep a lot of the uh, real dirty plastic containers in, in the uh, stream of plastic out there. So it just gets a quick rinse, goes right in the bucket. We might fill a 55-gallon barrel uh, a few times a day. That's, that's about our average day for uh, produce compost. Um, other ways we're reducing uh, packaging that's coming in to start with is uh, farmers using reusable containers like this. Uh, they can just keep using that plastic container. That's one of our local farms we deal with a lot. Uh, another simple way is uh, if you've got uh, tomatoes available from one farm and it's in a plastic container, uh, why get that when we've got uh, biodegradable containers that we've always used uh, that customers are going to be happy to buy as well. We get many calls from customers, uh, just people that uh, shop here all the time for us to save them boxes uh, and, and also to save compost for their chickens. Normally a lot of businesses such as ours, a, a food store or a large uh, business, anything that generates waste, a lot of times they'll have a compactor attached to their building where they throw their trash in and it'll compact to a smaller size so that it's easier to manage. We have a compactor that's for compost. So that particular compost, it gets compacted, but that compost is brought um, to a, a facility that has a very, very high heat. Other businesses could do something very similar by taking their existing compactor and converting it into a composter and then having a small dumpster which would take care of the rest of their trash. Now this box here is actually going to go back to the farmers. Um, we, a lot of them go right back to the farmers. They're nice and clean and everything else. But when they do get dirty or damaged, the wax boxes, which many businesses end up having to throw into their, their dumpster and then goes into the landfill, we actually can compost it, but it does work great. And it is a sealed system, so we don't have juices flowing. One thing we do have to maintain, though, is we have to maintain the system uh, as far as cleanliness. It has to be kept clean. Or, of course, we could have other issues with, um, with insects and possibly because the compactor is on the outside of the building, we do have mice coming down from the cliff, so we have to be careful and aware of that. We also put some traps around just to make sure. So I don't have any um, hard numbers on what the cost would be to have this sent to the landfill and have what it would actually cost us. But our dumpster, our regular dumpster, they empty twice a week. If we were not composting, they would have to empty that dumpster every day. No problem there. They would definitely, definitely get filled up every day. So that, that would be seven days a, a week and 
I'm, I'm sure the price would at least triple, if not quadruple, um, if this was going into the landfill. It would be quite expensive. From the month of April in 2013, that this compactor um, composter, they hauled away 5.85 tons of compost just in April. And here at River Valley Market, we have a great rate with alternative recycling, which is $45 a ton, which is much, much less than even composters in, in the big cities. They charge twice as much. But here, it's $45 a ton. The compactor also, we pay for it to be hauled back and forth. The compactor hauling service costs $115 a month. The compost compactor itself is $400 a month. Um, to lease it and we have an ozone odor control system inside of there which is included in that price. We also bail cardboard here. Our hauling service for the month of April was $300 it cost us to have the cardboard hauled away. However, we received revenue for that cardboard they hauled away which was $575.78. So the program does pay for itself. There's uh, $275 right there. Our dumpster outside for one month, it's 10 cubic yards dumpster. It's emptied twice a week here, and the dumpster is $3.97 a month. We have five 95-gallon mixed paper um, containers, and we have five 95-gallon mixed recyclables uh, plastics and cans that are in the container also. And <clears throat> those cost us $140 a week to have that. They are emptied, the paper is actually emptied every other week, there's five of them, and the bottles and cans, they're actually emptied every week. Uh, we obviously, we produce a lot of bottles and cans and kitchens and whatnot that we have here. And then we have to pay for a little bit of the fuel for when they're taking it back and forth, which is another $20. But for the total, for 2013, the total cost for April was $1,372. We had a revenue from our cardboard of $576, so the total cost of our waste was $796 for the month of April. We encourage people to try to use um, regular wear, regular stainless wares here. Um, we have obviously an industrial um, washing machine, dishwasher, and um, we try to encourage people to use these. Even when we have our board meetings upstairs, the board actually insists that they have these. They don't want to use the, the things that go into the compost. And here we have our area where we um, take care of our trash, our compost, our paper, and the last one over here is our cans and plastics recycling. So for our compost, let's see, first of all, I'd like to explain that this is a corn compostable cup that River Valley Market uses. It's, um, many people mistake it for being recyclable, but it's actually a compostable corn cup. The same thing goes with our utensils. These are called Green Wave, but there are a few different brands out there on the market at this point. Um, usually they're made with corn or wheat, but these are also compostable. These are not actual plastics, they're compostable materials. So these are all can go to the compost. And of course we have our napkins. And we do have a list of how to separate things. One of the hardest things at River Valley Market is trying to educate people on where to put the proper things. Uh, many times people will think that um, this is a plastic, so it's going to go in the trash, or this is uh, a plastic that will go in recycling, but in reality, these are both compostables. So we, that's a continuing thing, is the education here at River Valley Market. A lot of the compost here at River Valley Market um, will go into the large compost compactor, and it actually ends up at Martin's Farm in Greenfield, Massachusetts, where it is used um, as soil. Many things we can compost, we don't compost all of those things. Some things they go to the meat renderer, which is in our meat department. We would take the meat scraps, the fats and things like that that are compostable. They can go in the compost, but we send them to a meat renderer because it's better and the compost breaks down faster and easier. And then um, the meat renderer takes the fat and he makes soaps and those types of products with that. A lot of the compostables end up in other bins. Unfortunately, a lot of people are very confused and a lot of it ends up in the trash. We don't have somebody here policing the trash, so when things do end up in the trash that are compost, um, if it's things that aren't easy to get to, they do end up in the landfill. So it's another part of trying to get people educated and also very diligently trying to find products that are biodegradable and compostable.
so that if they do go into the trash, we can at least feel better about them being able to break down in the environment. The bio bags, just to give you a little hint of our compost, this particular bag is a little different. This is a green bag and it's a bio bag for compost. Some green plastics claim to be biodegradable and they're not compostable, they're biodegradable. So it's important to make sure you know the difference. This particular brand is BioTuff Compostable Bags by Heritage. And you can see inside of here, there's actually some cups and some napkins right now. When uh, our wellness department, which is the supplements, the health and beauty department, they'll get many products um, from distributors of Ender in California, but they're fragile, so they come packed with a lot of plastics and a lot of um, styrofoam. Now, not everybody does this, but we try to encourage them to, to change that, to not be styrofoam so that the, they are the biodegradable starch peanuts and so that the plastics that they do use are biodegradable or compostable sometimes. And or a lot of times people now are starting to use paper. It's important to try to get those people that are manufacturing and producing the goods to have an idea that these products need to change so that we can reduce our waste and our waste stream that's going into the landfill. Um, most landfills here in Western Massachusetts are now closed. Um, they just closed the one here in town a few months ago, which I was, didn't even know it was actually still open. I was surprised. But that's the way we're going. We all have to ship our trash somewhere else, and our landfills are full. They probably wouldn't be full if we had started moving uh, forward on this maybe 50 years ago or 75 years ago. I'm sure there would be a lot of landfill space in every town if we had made products that were recyclable, reusable, and we didn't just have a disposable economy. We try to encourage people to bring their own bags. So we have a program here at River Valley Market where people bring their bags. There's a little yellow stamp card that we stamp um, for their bags. And when the card is filled up, that card is worth a dollar. So in the future, River Valley Market has plans that hopefully, as we grow and continue to grow, we'll be able to open up another location or perhaps multiple locations here in the Pioneer Valley area, Western Massachusetts. And one of the things that we're hoping is that to get this program in full swing right from the start and to hopefully find ways that we can better improve this system so that we are reducing our waste um, going to the landfill by 100% would be great if we could. So this is our, our sanitation room, our dish room, where our, our dishwasher has to work all day. This is a very tough job. There's a lot of production that comes through our kitchen. So they actually have a few different things that they do to reduce the waste as well. Obviously, they have a disposal, with a very industrial-sized disposal, very food scraps that go in there. A lot of the kitchen scraps, though, and things are larger. So we actually have a large compost um, container right here. And there's actually a hole in this workstation so that the large compost, you can empty them right into the compost bag, goes right down into the bucket where there's a compost bag inside of that. And they can bring that right outside. Wedged in between there is a, a regular trash can with a regular trash bag for um, any of those things that are just trash that come through this way. A lot of things in there I see are labels of dates. Um, so, you know, when products uh, were produced, you see there's a large sour cream uh, container in there, and I see a whole bunch of clam shells that looks like they might have had berries in them, probably for the bakery, not sure. But uh, it gets filled up by, by them using products that they, they need for their production. So they actually have to bring that out a few times a day because it gets that full. This is our, our copier, uh, which goes through many, many copies. And right next to it, our recycle bin. So upstairs in our administration area, the human resources, and also in our manager's offices and the other offices, we have the <coughs> recycling bin here and we have the small trash bin and this works out quite well because most of the things that um, go into our recycling bin because we do a lot of paperwork and the trash actually is uh, not quite it's quite nominal every day there's not actually a lot of trash that gets generated with these small box these small containers um, but they get collected um, every night and when um, they are taken out at night you'll you'll notice that the, the recycling is a very very large um, a bit of recycling in the trash, a small bag. In this room, we have our marketing team. 
and they do a lot with our sign making, all our flyers, anything that has to do with marketing and print work. And here is one of the stations they have, and they have their cutters actually labeled. Um, this one's for paper only, do not cut for laminate. This one's for laminated because it gets sticky and, and gross. So paper, we have a large container for the paper here because many of uh, the paper, once it's cut, you know, you have to put it somewhere. So it's important to have this right next, right next to the thing so we can just put it in right away. We also have a small trash um, for anything that is laminated. If it's, uh, if it's laminated and we need to laminate something, we cut it out, we use it. Obviously, at that point, it's trash, so we end up throwing it away. One of the things that we have is at this desk, at Gail's desk, we have some paper. This, this is recycled paper, um, all paper that has been used for some other purpose. In this particular pile, everyone knows to put scrap paper here when they don't use it. And when they need scrap paper, you can come by there and reuse it. And we have a few of these piles, actually. There's another pile in the manager's office also worth scrap paper that um, if there's something that was printed wrong or some mistake made, we save it and we can always use the other side. And of course, we have in our break room a very large paper recycling as well. And there is another um, trash can on the other side that's about the same size as this. Uh, it generally doesn't get filled up. But the, the compost and the paper and the trash are all right here for very easy access. What we do in the evening after uh, everybody's done about 9 o'clock, we close at 9, so it's actually just a little bit before 9. Our hot bar, which uh, doesn't have much left, is placed in this hot bucket, in this five gallon bucket. And uh, usually, actually, there's two of them. And then this is picked up by a local farmer who feeds the um, leftovers to her chickens. And then she actually delivers us chicken eggs that we then purchase from her, from her farm, and we sell to our co-op members and owners. So it's all a big cycle. 